Anyway, my name is Tricia Rose, and I'm a professor in Africana Studies and also the director for CSREA. And um, this event is co-organized uh, by a grantee group that we provided funds for. One of the things CSREA has launched are collaborative research grants that are competitive and that faculty and graduate students in combination potentially with undergrads uh, can propose events or working groups or lecture series and this one is a signature event for an education uh, um, group that whose grant was funded uh, awards from us so we're very excited to have them here and I'm going to have Julia Daniels who is a key principal investigator for that research group introduce Professor Naguro but I just wanted to send spend a couple of minutes giving you some information about CSREA <laughs> while I have you here. Um, CSREA has been at Brown for many, many years, but it's sort of in a, a moment of transition. Under uh, my directorship, we've moved to the center of campus. We're temporarily in Hillel, but we have space up there for an art exhibit, and we have speakers all over campus, and uh, you know seminars, and faculty research series. And we're really trying to be a hub for <laughs> many different departments, interdisciplinary research endeavors, uh, programs that work on race and ethnicity, largely in the US, but also in some transnational contexts. And there, we want it to be a place that generates new ideas on critical issues. Why we love Professor Naguro's work so much is that it's both sophisticated and scholarly and reflective, but it also engages urgent issues that are s incredibly significant. Um, this is a privilege to be in a university, and it's an obligation, I think, to connect our work to the world in which we live. And that's part of CSREA's mission. So it's a, we're just really thrilled that he's here. So thank you for coming. Um, we're, we hope you'll come to other CSREA events. If you're not getting emails from me, write to CSREA. And uh, I mean, just go to the website and sign up for our mailing list. We'd love to have you. So now I invite Julia Daniel to introduce Professor Naguro. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Julia, and I've been working with Dr. Mona Abuzena, um, and we're really happy to have received the grant from CSREA and to be working on the symposium looking at issues of race and equity and gender in education. So I'm in the Urban Education Policy Program. Happy to see folks from that, from MAT and from other departments. Um, so yeah, just thanks everyone for coming. We're really excited to see Dr. Pedro Neguera here. His work is really important, really relevant um, across time. And I think especially right now, thinking about a lot of the work that's being taken up around black men and boys, um, he was one of the original theorists on this stuff. So it's a particularly impressive, important time to have him here. Uh, he's a professor in the Steinhardt Edu School of Education at New York University. As an urban sociologist, his scholarship and research focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions in the urban environment. Noguera has served as an advisor and engaged in collaborative research with several large urban districts throughout the United States, including Miami, I think. Uh, he's also done research on issues related to education and economic and social development in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and several other countries throughout the world. From 2000 to 2003, he served as the Judith K. Diamond Professor of Communities and Schools at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And from 1990 to 2000, he was a professor in the Social and Cultural Studies at the Graduate School of Education in Berkeley. Uh, he's published over 100 research articles, monographs, and research reports on topics such as urban school reform, conditions that promote student achievement, youth violence, the potential impact of school choice and vouchers on urban public schools, and race and ethnic relations in American society. His work has appeared in several major research journals that are available online in InMotionMagazine.com. Um, he wrote The Trouble with Black Boys and Other Reflection on Race, Equity, and the Future of Publication, which is an awesome and very important book that I hope everyone, if they haven't read it, get to read it. Um, and his new book um, is called Schooling for Resilience, Changing the Life Trajectories of African American and Latino Boys. Came out last week, so hopefully we all get a chance to look at that soon, too. Um, Noguera has also served as a member of U.S. Public Health Service Centers for Disease Control Task Force on Youth Violence, the chair of the Committee on Ethics in Research and Human Rights for the American Educational Research Association, and on many advisory boards to local and national education and youth organizations. He was a K-12 uh, classroom teacher for several years and continues to teach part-time in high schools. 
From 86 to 88, he served as the executive assistant to the mayor of Berkeley. From 1990 to 94, he was an elected member of the president of Berkeley's school board. In 1995, he received an award from the Wellness Foundation for his research on youth violence. In 1997, he was the recipient of the University of California's Distinguished Teaching Award. And in 2001, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of San Francisco and a Centennial Medal from Philadelphia University for his work in the field of education. He's the son of Caribbean immigrants. Uh, he's been married for 22 years to Patricia Vatuone. And he's also the father of four children. So it's not just my poor reading skills, but he's obviously accomplished a lot, as evidenced by how long it took me to read that bio. Um, so we are very lucky and grateful to have him here. Let's give him a round of applause. We're gonna do some questions afterwards, so if you wanna hold your questions till the end, we'll have some time for that. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon. It is a real pleasure to be here at Brown with you. I want to first of all thank the Center for the Study of uh, <coughs> Race and Ethnicity in America and uh, Professor Tricia Rose for extending this invitation. Um, thank all of you for coming out at the end of a school day. Uh, this is, you know, I, I went to Brown as an undergraduate, so I feel very much at home here. Lots of good memories, even in this building where I used to play basketball for <laughs> many, many hours. <laughs> wasn't the greatest gym, so it's much nicer as an auditorium, uh, but uh, good to be here. I, uh, I can't help but think of my former mentor, and I have to give some uh, praise to him, uh, Martin Martel, uh, who was, I think, one of the early, at least, planners of the center. I don't know if he lived long enough to see it come into being, but did he? He did. Okay, okay, good to know that. And Red Jones, another. Um, and so it's just good to know uh, that the legacy uh, that, you know, it's, uh, of, of, of a focus on race and ethnicity and inequality in America is still very much alive from the center. And I want to just say uh, I'm happy to be here and, and part of that. Um, it, it's interesting, the, the further removed I am from Brown, the better I feel about it um, in terms of uh, my experience here. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I've come to appreciate more and more how this time, these four years I spent here, um, did influence me and open doors. One of the people who was just here on this campus, um, Jim Kim, the current uh, president of the World Bank, was actually a student with me at Brown. And uh, not only did we play in this gym together, uh, but we were also very active politically in the Third World Coalition. And, uh, and so when you see students that you went to school with, go on to do very influential things, not just lead the World Bank, but people doing lots and lots of other things. It, it does um, give you an appreciation for uh, the significance of the time we had here. Uh, and I always felt that we learned as much outside of class, sometimes even more than we did in class. And I, I hear that that legacy is still alive too, of activism here at Brown. So I want to focus my remarks today around education and civil rights. Um, I want to do that uh, both because it's the 60th anniversary of the Brown decision, so I think it's important to reflect on the meaning of this landmark court case and what it means for America today. Uh, but I also want to do it because that slogan, that education is the civil rights issue of the 21st century, is one that gets used a lot. It gets used by many policymakers, including the President, as uh, the Secretary of Education likes to say it repeatedly, and many others. Um, and I think it's important that if we're going to use a term like that, that we reflect on what that really means. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, that the people who use it do so. Um, and so it's important, I think, to reflect then on what the Brown case itself represented uh, and, and what the crafters of that decision, particularly Thurgood Marshall, as the leader of the, uh, of the NWCP at the time and the lead counsel of the case, what they had in mind in pushing for an end to apartheid in American education, because that's really what it was. And if you read Marshall's memoirs, it becomes clear that he was not just thinking about integration for the sake of eliminating the racial barrier, though of course that was part of it. Brown, uh, Marshall also understood that the key to equity lie in integration. That is, for as long as schools were allowed to remain segregated on the basis of race, black children would always be relegated in inferior education. In some places, literally a shorter year, always inferior facilities, 
and uh, a whole litany of inequities and injustices perpetuated through that system of American apartheid known as, known as Jim Crow. And Marshall understood that if you could end the premise of racial segregation, you could then begin to challenge those inequities. Now, as we all know, um, the courts uh, ruled that this should happen with all deliberate speed, right, which was code word for saying, take your time. And that if it were not for Eisenhower, particularly a Republican president who was willing to back up the order with troops to Little Rock, Arkansas, which when you think about it was pretty amazing since it hadn't happened since the Civil War, that breaking down these barriers was something that was going to take time and would meet resistance. And so it's understandable that it would take time. But as we follow the path of integration in schools in this country, what we see is that after some considerable progress in the 1960s and 1970s, we not only have stopped making progress, we've actually gone into reverse. And if you look at the work done by Gary Orfield and his colleagues at the uh, Civil Rights Project now at UCLA, you will see that not only are schools more segregated today than they were in the 1980s, but they are increasingly in a form of hyper-segregation where children are segregated by race and class. <coughs> and so the patterns you see in Rhode Island are patterns we see everywhere where Providence is largely this enclave of children of color, mostly very low income, surrounded by a sea of white children. And that pattern exists to varying degrees across America, including in our suburbs, which many people held out the hope, well, the suburbs would be the place that, as they integrated, would generate more integrated schools. And while that does exist in some parts of the country, for the most part, our, sub our suburbs are segregated also, both with respect to housing and education. And since President Obama's election, we haven't heard any mention about desegregation as a priority. And so when you think about it, despite the fact that this country literally sent troops into Arkansas, literally had blood on the streets in Boston, because Boston came to epitomize the fight over busing, it's now a non-issue, the issue that's never discussed anymore. So even as they talk about education civil rights issue, they don't talk about that issue. And so in many ways, we find ourselves in a situation where we have really gone back to Plessy. Separate, but profoundly unequal. Because throughout America, not only do we segregate kids by race and class, not by law, but by residence, but we also, almost always, and with few exceptions, fund schools based on local property taxes, which has the effect of spending the most money on the most affluent children and the least money on the neediest children. And that pattern of inequity in education is a uniquely American pattern. Most other countries in the world do not fund schools in that way. And despite several court orders at several states challenging that, that pattern pretty much continues to uphold. But it's the issue that we also don't talk about in education today. That is, even as we use policies to advance <coughs> higher achievement in the name of economic competitiveness, because that's usually what goes with the need to raise our scores and improve our schools, is that we need to be competitive with the Chinese or the Indians or some other country. We don't talk about the fact that when you disaggregate the data and look at why so many other countries are outperforming the United States, the real source of our problem is inequality. Affluent children are doing very well in America. Maybe not as well as they are in Singapore, but they're doing pretty good. It's when you control for poverty and look at districts that have poverty rates that exceed 25% that you realize that those are the places that bring us way down in the comparisons. And that's because not only do we fund the schools unequally, 
but we completely ignore the non-academic needs of children. I want you to think about that for a moment. That is that one of the great ironies of the no child left behind law, which has come to embody <coughs> chapter one, or uh, com what we used to call compensatory education, which we will also be celebrating or recognizing the 50th anniversary of that part of the Civil Rights Act this year. Even though it was initially intended as a way to compensate for what poor kids didn't receive, to make sure they got a little bit more, now it has come to represent simply that we will hold all children to the same academic standards, hold their schools accountable for meeting standards and, 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 and achievement bars that we set. So it's equitable in that way but do nothing about the conditions under which they learn or the needs that they bring with them to school. So what is the other pattern we see? In every community with high levels of poverty, what do we find? We find low levels of achievement and often failing schools. And somehow, even as we say we're trying to do something about the achievement gap as a nation, we ignore the fact that so much of that gap is about other gaps, like gaps in access to health care and food and housing. I was in Michigan just a few weeks ago, and I literally met principals who were sending children home on weekends with extra food because they knew the children did not eat regularly on the weekends. Right now, we have poverty rates over 20% of children in America, highest amongst all advanced countries. There's no provision, no child behind to make sure that children get access to food, or eyeglasses, hard to read if you can't see, or dental care, or to get the asbestos or lead out of their homes. None of those provisions are part of No Child Beyond, even though we have ample research that those kinds of needs impact learning outcomes. What we've decided to do over the last few years is to focus narrowly on achievement and ignore everything we know about child development and child welfare. And so even as they, they and by they I mean our policymakers say, education is the civil rights issue of the 21st century, and we're going to close this achievement gap, it rings hollow because we're only focused on what schools do. James Coleman, sociologist at Harvard, back in 1966, just as the country was contemplating whether or not the war on poverty should include an effort to <coughs> equalize funding in schools, equalize opportunity in education, did this landmark study, which was interpreted as saying, well, much of the inequity in academic outcomes is driven by inequity in the education of parents, in incomes, in the backgrounds of children. Now some people interpreted that as a way to do nothing about schools, or very little. Others say, well, it should be used as a call for doing more about poverty and about those inequities. But if you remember the history, Nixon ended that war on poverty. <laughs> Although even Nixon was still calling for full employment, something we haven't heard a candidate for a public office talk about probably since then. But today, we pretend as though the non-academic needs of children are irrelevant. We have what my colleague Richard Rothstein calls a schools alone strategy for addressing educational outcomes and improving performance. And we have absolutely no evidence that that's ever going to work. And with the schools alone strategy comes a blaming of schools for their failure. Their failure to perform at higher levels. And if you're going to blame the schools, you have to blame the people working schools, the teachers, and the administrators. And so what we've seen, along with No Child Behind, although I would say you can't put everything on No Child Behind, some of this is add-ons. Race for the Top is an add-on. We've seen threats, and in some cases, many cases, 
the threats carried out of school closure. So we closed schools. Michael Bloomberg, as mayor of New York, closed over 140 schools. We're seeing just this year, this summer, over 50 schools closed in Chicago, dozens closed in Philadelphia. All of the guys, well, sometimes they say it's because of money, other times simply because these are failing schools and therefore we will shut them down. Even though they can't explain why they failed, in fact, there was a study done in New York City that many of the schools that had been closed for failing had in fact been designed to fail. Designed to fail because they deliberately staffed the school with the least prepared teachers and enrolled the neediest children. A combination that almost never works. And so what we're witnessing in the name of higher performance and higher achievement is a whole host of policies that not only don't address the sources of inequity, also have the effect of undermining public education. Because as we're seeing in particularly our large cities, as schools get closed and replaced by charter schools or as teachers get vilified, for causing these problems. We see teachers leaving the profession. We see parents who can choosing to exit the public schools. And we see systems that once were quite solid and strong. I mean, I was visiting Detroit, another city. Not surprising if the city's bankrupt, the schools will also be in trouble. We're visiting a high school there, there's a, there's a wall of fame distinguished alumni, all African-American on the wall. And that school had produced judges and attorneys and military people and all types of important dignitaries over the years. And so it's being shown to the, the school and, and they were with pride showing me the alumni. I said, how many of the kids you have now would end up on this wall? And the principal looked at me and said, probably not. I said, why not? He said, because we're a failing school. I said, so does that mean the talent has left Detroit? <laughs> and he didn't know how to answer my question because he didn't really understand that the job of schools is not merely to measure achievement. It's actually to develop talent in children. That was an understanding that schools used to have. Um, and it's not to romanticize the good old days because I already said those schools were often segregated and those schools were often underfunded. And, and the, what was offered in the way of education, not necessarily what I would uphold as being the best, but I would, I would say that it's ironic that many of these hyper-segregated schools produced a generation of educated African Americans who went on to hold important positions once the racial barriers ended. Looking at a picture of Pine Bluff High School, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I was struck by the fact that I'm looking at the old yearbooks. So many of the faculty in the school had PhDs. I'm asking my friend whose father went there, I said, how do they have someone with a PhD in chemistry teaching high school in Pine Bluff? He said, who else would hire them? So there were some benefits of segregation, at least to those children, not to the PhD holders, mm -hmm. perhaps. But those schools did produce a generation of professionals, of teachers, and in some cases doctors and others. And so now we find ourselves in a situation where our policies produce more failure. Our policies um, produce, I think, a growing lack of support. And uh, don't get us where, as a country, we think we need to be with a more educated population that are able to deal with the challenge of the 21st century. So 2008, I was one of uh, several people that put forward a, a policy proposal. We did it just before the presidential election, and we said that we needed a, a different approach to educating children. We called it a broader and bolder approach. We said the minimum, the next president, the next administration, when they reauthorize No Child Behind, need to do three things. They need to expand access to preschool. So all the research showed that the early learning laid the foundation. They need to expand access to health care for children especially because that too impacted learning outcomes. 
and they need to extend learning opportunities into the summer and after school because there was actually a gap in learning time between poor and middle class kids in America. And we thought that this was kind of like a no-brainer, easy. Presented the research and studies supporting these recommendations, and we got a long list of dignitaries from a variety of fields to sign on and put it out in the front page or in a full page ad in the New York Times and the Washington Post. A week after we put out the ad, another group stepped forward. They took out a full page ad too. They called themselves the Equity Commission. But this group was headed by Lou Gingrich, the former speaker, the Reverend Al Sharpton, and the former Chancellor of New York City, Joel Klein. And they basically said, anyone who is saying poverty is the issue is making excuses, and what we need is more accountability. Now what's interesting about these two proposals and these two advertisements is that Secretary Duncan signed them both. And that told me a lot about what was to come. Just before he was appointed Secretary of Education, I sat on a, I actually moderated a panel with himself and Jeffrey Canada. Jeffrey Canada is the founder and until recently the CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone. Provides a broad array of services for children, 6,000 children in Central Harlem. And Jeffrey had been explaining what they were doing and what the strategy was based on, so I asked Jeffrey Canada, if there was any evidence that those kinds of services they were providing to children were going to improve academic outcomes. And he said, I reject the question. I said, well, why do you reject the question? He says, no one asks middle class kids if they get their teeth fixed, will they improve their test scores? Or if they get to play violin, will their grades go up? We don't ask those questions of middle class kids. Why should we ask poor children? Ask that of poor children. Well, that's a good point. So I turned to Arnie Duncan and I said, what do you think of that? And he sat looking perplexed at first and he said, I think he's going to need some evidence. And that, too, spoke volumes to what was to come. Because equity is the word we haven't heard from this administration in their education policies. Equity in finance not discussed, equity and learning opportunities, going back to, again, Marshall's original strategy, that this was really about equalizing opportunity to learn, not discussed. Even after they, Congress did an equity commission report, which you can download online, which called for a much more targeted focus on these inequities among schools, the inequities and learning opportunities. The administration has largely ignored them. And I can't say that's simply a matter of Congress, because as we know, this administration took stimulus funds to promote race for the top. A set of policies which are not based on any research at all, which uses competition to reward schools, which does crazy things like say that you're going to judge teachers based on the test scores of their students, even though there's absolutely no research supporting that as a strategy, which says that the way to improve schools is to fire half the teachers or to get rid of the principal, even though we know in many places there are no replacements ready to staff those schools. But this is what we spent several hundred million dollars on over the last few years. And so I would say it's not surprising that we're not making progress. However, there is some good news out there. And the good news is coming from a small number of cities and schools that have decided not to wait for Washington to set a different course. They decided on their own that we can, in fact, approach this differently and figure out ways to do a better job of educating our kids. And I already mentioned the Harlem Children's Zone as one, but they're the most well-known because Jeffrey County's gotten a lot of attention and these raised $170 million, which already tells you it's not replicable because most other communities won't be able to do that. But there are now a number of schools across the country that are finding ways to bring resources into schools that will serve kids' non-academic needs health clinics on site, social workers on site, parent education. 
I work with the school in, in Brooklyn, Bethesda Stuyvesant, PS28. Now we have very fancy names for our schools. You know, it's, a, it's a full service school. Full service school. I'm invited there by the principals, Sadie Silva. She says, Welcome to my school. Explains to me that 40% of her students are homeless. 40%. Says, come, let's go visit some classrooms. Going to classrooms, and the first thing I noticed is that every classroom has four and five adults in the classroom. So I said, Where do you get all these teachers? She said, Well, they're not all teachers. I said, since almost a third of my students are special ed students, all of my special ed teachers are in the classrooms working with the other teacher. The kids can't tell who's who. I said, Well, who are the others? She said, Those are parents we train to work with teachers. They have a whole cadre of parents who volunteer in a variety of roles. I see one parent, she's standing next to a little boy. I said, why is she so close to that little boy? She said, well, she's there to keep him calm. We're glad she's here. I see a little boy raise his hand. As if to go to the bathroom, teacher just looks at him and nods. He gets up out of his seat, goes to the restroom, comes right back. So I turned to the principal and said, I'm impressed. She said, why? I said, well, I see he went to the bathroom. I don't see any guards. He, he didn't get lost. He just came right back. She laughed. She said, my kids have to walk on the most dangerous streets in New York City. If I can't teach them to use the bathroom properly, I've failed as a principal. She says that the school works through partnerships. It has a partnership with Downstate Medical School that provides a clinic on site. A nurse comes to, is at the school every day. Optometrist at the school once a month. Dental work at the school. They have another partnership with a community development corporation that does GED classes for parents job training for parents. They believe that if parents are educated and employed, they'll do a better job with the children. And they had another partnership with the YMCA that allows the school to stay open every night till 6 o'clock. These kids are getting help with homework, they're getting art, they're getting music, they're getting chess, they're getting robotics, they get swimming lessons on Thursdays. And because this, the shelter doesn't open until 6 o'clock, it means they're also not on the street. She says, I want to show you the professional development I have going for my teachers. She takes me to another room. There are two social workers working with a group of eight teachers. And the teachers are posing questions based on the challenges they're seeing with their students. One has a child who's aggressive. Another one has a child who's depressed. Another one has a child with attachment issues. He says, he's attached to my leg and I can't teach. And the social workers are offering suggestions, very practical things. This is what you should do. Come back tomorrow and let us know what how it works. So I'm listening to this conversation. I asked the principal again, is why made you decide to offer this as a form of training for your teachers? She said, well, until I did, my teachers were referring too many children to special education. So what I realized, they had to improve their skills, increase their skills, because I have a very high need population. Not just any teacher can work here. She said, let me introduce you to my guidance counselor. Walked down the hall, she said, but I have to tell you, I got him from the rubber room. Now, in New York City, there was a place they used to call the rubber room where they would put teachers who had been written up for some kind of infraction, and they could stay there sometimes for years. Not allowed to teach children, but they could be paid. So I asked her, well, how do you know to get this man from the rubber room? She said, well, I don't know why he was there in the first place, but he was my guidance counselor when I was in school. And so when I heard he was there, I requested it, and they said, you could have it. So I go in there to meet the counselor, and he's talking to a little boy, and I introduce myself to a little boy, and I ask, little boy, why are you here today? He says, well, I'm here to learn how to be good. So I say, is it working? He says, I hope so, because I'm tired of being put out of class. And then they explain to me that the school has a zero, no suspension policy. Children are not allowed to be suspended. So they really were focused on how to help them conduct themselves appropriately in the classroom. So I say to say, you know, I'm going to write to the chancellor and tell him what I saw today at your school because I think it's very impressive. He needs to know what you're doing here. So well, if you're going to contact the chancellor, I would need to show you one more thing. He <coughs> takes me to her office, and the first thing I'm struck by is her office is set up like a classroom. So well, what happens there? She said, I work with kids that the teachers are struggling with because I'm the lead teacher. And then she says, I have portfolios for every single student in the school with their work so I can let the parent know exactly where they are and how they're doing, and I've developed a data system to monitor each and every single student. So I said, okay, now I'm even more impressed. 
Nothing's left to chance. All very deliberate, very focused. So I write to the chancellor, who at the time is Joel Klein. I tell him we need to go visit. Three days later, he does. And he's also impressed. So he writes about it in a newsletter that goes out to every principal in New York City. That's 1,700 principals in New York City. But the only thing he mentions about his visit is the data system that she was using. Because New York City had just spent $100 million on that data system. He was glad to see someone using it. And then I write to him and say, you know, I'm so glad you visited, but you missed it. Because it's not just the data system that makes that school work. That school, two years ago, got the highest gains in literacy and math in, in Brooklyn. It's living proof that the problem at that school is not the children it serves, but how those children are served. That school has done something that a number of other schools, but particularly schools in Toronto, have done over the last several years, which they built capacity in schools. It's a very different way of thinking about the challenge facing schools than what we see coming from most state governments. That is, rather than going in and saying, you're a failing school, they go in and say, you know what, this school needs a social worker, or this school needs better math teachers, or this school needs training in this area because the kids can't read. They work on building capacity in terms of resources and skills on the part of the educators. And what's interesting about this is despite the crack-smoking mayor of Toronto, <laughs> that city has produced more high-performing schools than any city in North America, high-performing poverty schools, impoverished schools. So there are examples at scale that show us a different strategy could actually work. And there are others that aren't at scale, but are still showing us great promise. You've got one right here at the Met, where I was earlier today, where I met young people who are excited about learning, excited about their projects, who are learning to develop their own businesses, who are doing internships in interesting fields, and going off to college. And it's an integrated school in a city that has very few. We have 38 schools like that in New York City. They do a performance assessment. They think it's not good enough to look at students' test scores. They want to know, can that student actually write? Can they do research? What can they produce? So the learning is done with the teacher through a process, an iterative process, where it's submit, revise, submit, revise. And every student is responsible for a product that varies from year to year. Research shows those kids are doing far better in college, less likely to need remedial courses when they go than kids who go through more traditional schools. So we have examples out there that there is a different approach that's possible. Brockton High School, not too far from here in Massachusetts, is the largest school in the state with over 4,000 students, the only urban district in Massachusetts that gets a level one rating from the state. They did something radical, started back in 2002, when the state was implementing its high stakes exams. They knew that over 50% of the kids would not pass because they could not read at grade level. So instead of bringing a test prep system from Kaplan, they decided to actually teach kids to read. And they made sure that every teacher at the school, regardless of what they taught, could also teach reading. It took them time to get convinced teachers because it's a unionized school, so they couldn't force the teachers to be trained. But over time, every teacher, whether they were a math teacher, a science teacher, a phys ed teacher, an art teacher, every teacher teaches literacy. For the last three years in a row, one third of the senior class at Brockton High School has qualified for the Adams Scholarship because they got the highest possible score on the state exam. And that gives them full scholarship to any public university. Of those third, one-third African-American, one-third white, one-third Latino. So we have examples out there that show us a different strategy is possible. And I would hope that we use these examples, and I'm one of the people pushing for this, to start to craft new policies. Now New York City is a place that I think has enormous potential because we have a mayor who has campaigned on the pledge that inequality is the priority for New York City. And since the mayor controls the schools in New York City, so now is a chance to enact policies that will hopefully begin to counter some of the effects and 
inequality in the city. So far, they've only talked about universal preschool, which I already said is, I think, about most importance, but not good enough. Because if you don't provide good K through 12 education, the benefits of that good preschool can be undone, or can be more limited. We haven't yet heard what the mayor has in mind, but I would say that we have examples of how to use education to mitigate the effects of poverty, and in some cases, break the cycle of poverty even within families. To me, this is what education as a civil rights issue really represents. You know, the African-American scholar, sociologist, historian, W.B. Du Bois, said that the problem of the 20th century would be the color line. If that's still the problem in the 21st century, we are in big trouble. The majority of children in America today are already children of color. By 2041, the majority of people in this country will be people of color. The people who should be most concerned about our inability to educate the children in our schools today should be old white people whose retirements will be determined and be dependent upon these young people being gainfully employed and supporting them in their retirement. The problem is that politically we don't see these connections. We think those are other people's kids. Providence is problems. Hope High is problems. Central Falls problems. Not an American problem. And I would say that that ultimately is what prevents us from doing what is within our reach. The only thing preventing the United States from doing a better job of educating children is a lack of will. And in many cases, a lack of imagination. We've been using fear as a motivator on schools. I'd say we would get far more done using hope as a motivator for many of the particularly kids who already know failure and aren't afraid of it. And again, there are examples of schools doing just that. So let me close with that. Let me give you, hopefully, an example that can make you feel as though this can be done, because it's happening in the South Bronx, too. At PS 138 on Willis Avenue, that's part of the Bronx that burned in the 1970s burned because a lot of the landlords decided it was better to burn the property and collect the insurance than to fix it up. So throughout much of the 80s, it looked like a war zone. Burnt out buildings. But the projects on, one, on Willis Avenue are still there. Those are the projects my grandmother lived in for over 20 years. So when I heard that there was a high-performing school on Willis Avenue at PS 130, I said, I got to see this for myself. So I go to visit the school, and I'm greeted by a little girl. She's a fourth grader. She says, welcome to the school. I'm in Torka. <laughs> First thing she shows me are all the awards the schools won, in the state and other, other places. And articles that have been written on the school about its accomplishments. So I said, well, this is great. This is wonderful. Just let me take you some more. Takes me to the library. The library is just a lovely, very comfortable place where you'd want to read. Kids are there reading. She explains that there's an ongoing competition in the school amongst classes by grade for who can read the most books. I said, what do you win? She said, at the end of the month, the class that's read the most books gets pizza. And note, they read books, not parts of books, but whole books. Because they actually believe that by providing kids with access to good literature, they'll cultivate a desire to read in the children. I was at a school recently where I saw some kids reading an excerpt from Call of the Wild by Jack London, a book I liked as a kid. I asked the kids what they thought of it. And one of them said, you know, I really liked it. I wish they'd give us the whole thing. I want to know how it ends. I've never seen anybody take an excerpt from a reading to the beach. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> she takes me and shows me this artwork on the wall. She shows me the newsletter full of articles written by kids, by kids, their own poetry. So I said, well, this is one of this must be such a great place to go to school. I said, I haven't even shown you the best part yet. So let's go upstairs. She takes me upstairs, and I learned that the only museum in New York City that's dedicated to the history of the Bronx is in their school. But it's not locked away in a classroom. It's all out in the hallway. 
The first thing you see is a picture of the Bronx family that spelt their name with a K, not an X. German family hold a large farm. See a picture of the Yankees from the 1920s when Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were on the same team. See a picture of Joe Lewis when he fought Max Schmeling at Yankee Stadium. See the first album by the jazz artist Donald Byrd in Glass and by his student Willie Colon, who both lived in that neighborhood. See memorabilia and all kinds of antiques and various kinds of things out on display and all within easy reach of children. So the first thing that comes to my mind is that this could easily be stolen or vandalized or taken. So I turn to the little girl and I ask her, aren't they worried that the kids might take some of this or break it? And the little girl looks at me like I'm some kind of sicko. <laughs> and she says, I don't know about the schools you go to normally. <laughs> but at this school, children take care of things. Why do I ask the question? I ask the question because I'm increasingly accustomed to going to schools where children are treated like inmates in a prison. A school like the one I visited in Oakland, California, visiting an eighth grade science classroom, and I noticed there's no science equipment. And I asked the teacher, where's the science equipment? She says, I lock it up. I said, why do you lock it up? She said, I lock it up so they don't break it. So then I asked, well, do they ever get to use the science equipment? She says, occasionally, if they're well behaved, I would let them use the science equipment. And I could tell by the way she said it, that didn't happen very often. She reminded me of someone, you ever go to someone's house and they've got their furniture covered? Because <laughs> they're waiting for that special guest to come? And you know when you go and it's covered, that means you're not the special guest. <laughs> well, the children of 138 are treated like they are special guests each and every day, and they respond like they are too. And they take care of their school, and take pride in what they're doing. They can't change the circumstances those kids live in, but they change the kind of education they receive. And so while it would be necessary and essential for us to launch a new war on poverty, to do far more than we're doing right now, particularly as poverty rates grow and so many people are stuck in low-wage jobs, in the interim, we could do so much more just to do a better job educating kids great schools that kids were excited about attending, where they were excited about learning. That's possible right now. I think the only thing preventing us from doing that is, again, the lack of will. So thank you for the invitation, and I look forward to hearing your questions. I think it's really important to kind of reframe the debate because I think what's happening in a lot of the public discourse on education is blaming parents, blaming students, blaming teachers. And so I really appreciate bringing this perspective here. Um, so we are going to take some time to take questions. We have a microphone back here. If you want to pick people, I'll bring, bring you the microphone. So. Yep, yeah, and then get back next. <laughs> So I was so I was on the in the North Public Schools when you were working with Dr. Jamie, uh, and now with uh, Kimmy Anderson and the One Word Plan, and her sort of refusal now to attend board meetings and all these other ludicrous uh, activities. What do you see as the for people in Newark? What is the alternative, right? So when especially when a district is controlled by the state, how well, how do you make headway, um, and how, what should the response be? That's a really really. Um, Tough question. This is for context for those of you who don't know. Newark's been under state control now for, I think, almost 15 years. Um, and that means Governor Christie controls and appoints the superintendent, uh, not the board, the elected board. Uh, I was working in Newark, as you pointed out, for four years. We were trying to, to essentially replicate the Harlem Children's Zone in the central ward of Newark uh, by bringing in um, supports to schools getting parents much more engaged, and were producing great results. Central High School, which was the, at the hub, had the highest gains of any one of those under performing schools in the state of New Jersey in those two years. <coughs> New superintendent's appointed. She decides that's not her plan. She's doing something else. So we are based, in effect, told to leave <laughs> after four years of work. Um, and she has so far demonstrated no interest whatsoever in engaging the community in the process because 
you know, as is often the case for these reformers, they think they know best, <laughs> so it'll be their way. We do reform two people, two communities, two schools, not with them, very much our approach. And so the political lesson I've drawn is that we should have done even more work to get political support to resist it, right? Uh, now, I don't know if we could have, ultimately, because legally, the state still does control it. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that's where it's got to get tied up, um, is to figure out some way to unleash the, 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 the district from the state's control, um, especially given that the state's not doing anything to actually help the district <laughs> while it's in this period of, of control. But that, unfortunately, where it lies with the lawyers. Um, I think it, we, we were under the mistaken, uh, I, I got in through the former governor, Corzine, who had asked me to assist Newark. And so the, the whole political scene in New Jersey was different when we started the work, and it quickly changed. Uh, when Corzine lost to Christie and, and, and new players were there to be dealt with. So the lesson I draw is we've got to do, if you're going to do this work, you've got to make sure you have not just support at the top, but much more support at the bottom. We had a lot of parental support, but not enough to counter, although the parents are very angry about what's happened. So eventually, you know, what I've said is we put our work on hold. We'll be back as soon as current support has gone. <laughs> Professor Henry. Uh, you mentioned uh, Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned Toronto in your talk. What has always struck me about Toronto and other Canadian cities is that through their housing policies, they're cities without ghettos. This is something that I think uh, here in the United States we ignore, that there can be cities without ghettos. And the examples are Canadian cities, so right to the north. So that in terms of the work that you are suggesting needs to be done uh, so that by the time kids get to school, uh, you see, it would seem to me that if we had a different housing policy, if we just took a few pages from the Canadian book, that some of these problems of having to you know, create schools for homeless kids and all of this stuff, I mean, it's just a simple question. Why don't Canadian cities have ghettos? <laughs> okay? and, and, and all of these problems, a lot of them. I mean, you have, you have poor sections uh, of Toronto, you've got poor kids, there's a problem. But the point is, that sense of being ghettoized, and a lot of problems that come out of that, right, are problems that Canadians have solved. Uh, no, I think that's a very good point. I mean, you know, we could learn a lot of things like from Canadians if we were willing, right? <laughs> Higher education is extremely affordable. <laughs> For example, in, in Canada, it's all public too. Um, the healthcare system works. Um, now, if there were Canadians in the audience, uh, they're back. Right? If the Canadians were here, they would say, "Oh, it's not as good as you think." You know, it's really, you know, Toronto's not that great. And and you know, it's true. When I visited, I did find schools that you knew these were where the immigrant kids were concentrated. But what's different about them? They were still good schools. Right? I mean, they, it didn't look shabby. They didn't look like they were falling apart. They, they, you know, it, it, those kinds of inequities don't exist there, right? But what, what I found particularly interesting is I did some work with the Minister of, Edu of, of Education for Ontario, and it's the language they use to describe how they approach schools that are struggling. And this is the language that I, I described of capacity building, right? Not of judging. You know, we, what we do here is we, we go and tell a school, you're failing. Fix yourself or we will do something to you. <laughs> and, um, and so we, get a, we use pressure as a strategy. They have a different strategy. Yes? So uh, I think what I heard you describing was a process whereby <coughs> I, I thought I heard you saying an example about Detroit and the wall of, of, of honors or whatever, that there seemed to have been a shift from schools to places where you cultivate children to schools as places where you measure children for the talents that they had when they walked in the door. I don't know if it's accurate. Did it, is there a shift from sort of cultivating students as whole people to simply measuring them uh, and there, then calibrating? Or is that actually a different trajectory? There, there has been a shift, right? And um, it, it, you know, Howard Gardner um, at Harvard talks about the fact, you know, in this country, it was common for every kindergarten teacher to have a piano in the room, and to know how to play the piano. <laughs> All throughout, up until the 1970s. Because we understood, at one point in time, that music was a great foundation for learning. <laughs> Today, 
pianos, uh, you know, have some, but increasingly not present. Because we see music as an extra that's unnecessary. Not on the test, so what do you need it for? Um, and so, so much of what we have known historically about child development is increasingly not reflected at all in our policies when we think about achievement. Um, and I would, again, I don't want to romanticize the past because we had high dropout rates. In the, we didn't even expect people to graduate from high school for the longest time in this country. That was also because there were blue collar union jobs out there for people without high school diplomas. Um, but there was a way in which um, the, the standards were not as, um, didn't produce the same degree of inequity. And I could, I could describe, you know who's written well about this is Vanessa Siddell Walker, um, who writes about some of the, the, the positive aspects of segregated schooling that have been lost um, because of desegregation. And um, you know, it, so again, it's not to say that we want to return to segregation, but it's to say, you know what, some of those segregated schools were pretty, you know, Ruth Simmons, the former president, went to segregated schools in Houston. <laughs> And um, you know, and you can go on and on about naming people who were able to use education as a pathway to a better life at one point in time in this country's history. Now, I'd say it wasn't just school. There were other things like when I went to school, Pell Grants, right, and and affirmative action and things like that. But um, I do think that that it was that, that, that was a different set of strategies. Um, Barton and Coley, two researchers at the Educational Assessment Service have an important paper called, Why Aren't We Making More Progress? And they asked the question, they said, up until the 1970s, gaps in achievement, if you just look at achievement levels as measured by reading and math, were leveling between black and white children, just looking at those two groups. And then by the 1980s, they leveled off, and the gaps actually started widening, and have stayed like that for the last 20 plus years. Say so why? What's different? Say so, well, the only thing really different is not just where the poli education policy is different, but we did have housing policies, we had employment policies, we had a different set of social policies focused on addressing poverty that we don't have now. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so I'm a teacher in training right now, um, in school in Providence, um, and I really appreciate sort of your comments and remarks um, on the role of poverty in schools and how we need to look at students' entire lives instead of just what happens at the school. And I really appreciate the way um, that you've interpreted Coleman and Rothstein's work as saying, you know, there is a role for schools, but we need to look at poverty as well. So my question is, um, sort of as, as an aspiring teacher, what, what, is an effective, what does an effective teacher look like to you? And especially sort of in an era where we have um, about 90% white middle class teachers teaching our low income students of color, um, what remarks do you have about um, the type of teaching force we need to be developing and the cultural competencies and skills that our teaching force should have? Okay. So big questions, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but important questions. So I, I would say that you know, so much of teaching is rooted in the relationship between teacher and student. That is, if you have strong content, command of the content, but don't know how to relate to your children, you will find children who refuse or won't learn from you. You may have seen that already. <laughs> right. um, and, but that's the hardest part to teach a teacher, right, is how do you forge a relationship right, with a student, particularly if there's a race, class, language, culture difference there with a the student. But I'd say that's really the essence of what we need to focus on much more than we do right now, is how to help teachers build those kinds of relationships with their students. I would also say that students are much more open to that relationship, in many cases, than teachers realize. Right? If you talk to kids and you ask teacher, them, who are your best teachers, they don't talk in terms of race. They talk in terms of the qualities of the person and what that person does for them and how they teach them and, and how they connect with them. Um, it's often the adults who have so much more baggage based on their own biases accumulated over time. Uh, and the children can tell. The children can tell if you're afraid of them. They can tell if you are uncomfortable around them. And they can tell if, if for whatever reason, you are uneasy. And that often is a barrier that affects learning. So I would say we need to spend much more time in that. And, you know, it's very important. I often said, I was saying this to a group of uh, students earlier today, that when I taught, uh, I started teaching here at Central High School. Um, they would, you know, I, I realize, close the door, I've got the power. 
You know, my master teacher didn't want to watch me anyway. He was off drinking coffee someplace, right? So I could do all kinds of things to engage my students. And, and so what, what strikes me a lot of times is that what's missing from teachers, because I often wonder, you know, I, in my, one of the courses I teach, I, I focus on how schools are implicated in the reproduction of inequality. Right? And the data shows this is very clear. That this, rather than being the engine of mobility, it's the engine of reproduction that we see through schools. So if that's true, empirically true, why? What's in it for teachers? Why should teachers be complicit in this process of reproduction? Now, I realize it's a bigger process than that. It's not simply about what happens between teacher and student. There's more at work than that. There's policy, there's everything else. But in too many cases, I teach, see teachers who form oppositional relationships with students. They see us against them. Right? Rather than we are in this together. Or, or we are in this with your parents in support of you. And I think that different outlook about how you see yourself as a teacher is essential for, for getting different results and forging different kinds of relationships. And, you know, fortunately I get to see teachers who do that too. Uh, here and then there. Um, I'm a research teacher here at Brown. Well, and I, I really enjoyed the case you made for capacity building. And I'm wondering in this era of really in this era of really intense debate over increasing private involvement in public schools, what role, if any, you think the private sector can play in this capacity building, especially considering how limiting and entrenched the property tax funding model is in this country? Well, I think we have to turn to the private sector. They got all the money, right? <laughs> you got to go where the money is, right? And, um, you know, it would be nice if you could just say, let the state provide, but, you know, as we know, the state's coffers are not where they should be, and so, but so the question is, I mean, right now, the, the scary thing about that is big philanthropy has a lot of say over the direction of policy. Uh, and if you just look at the Gates Foundation in particular, Gates Foundation made a $2 billion bet from 1996 to 2004 on small schools. And they spent money all around the country to make schools small. And then by 2004, they finally realized, guess what, it takes more than being it takes more to be good than just being small. Because they completely ignored instruction, they ignored a lot of other things. So they said, okay, we're not going to ignore small schools, we're done with that. Now we're going to only focus on teacher effectiveness. And so for the last several years, that's what Gates has been funding, various kinds of studies to promote teacher effectiveness. But they completely have lost what teacher effectiveness looks like because it's so disconnected from how kids actually learn. We're not studying learning. How do kids learn when they're out of school? And how do you get kids to excited to learn while they're in school? We're, we're, we still expect kids to learn the way we teach. And if they can't do it, then we say something wrong with them. I was I used this example earlier today. How does a child learn to play a video game? They don't download a lecture. They get on and they play the game. And they play the game through trial and error. And they learn from the mistakes. And after they've been playing it for a while, usually many, many hours, they master the game, right? Any video gamers here? Master the game, then you're ready for a new game, right? How often do kids experience mastery in school? Can kids say, you know, I took chemistry, I've mastered chemistry, I'm ready for physics. <laughs> I've mastered the composition, I'm ready for the research paper. Right? We don't think about learning in those kinds of ways. We don't think enough about learning through trial and error, learning from your mistakes. We use the mistakes against you. Say, oh, let's take you down a grade. Rather than say, no, correct the mistakes, resubmit. Right? Isn't that the way we learn best, right? Revise, resubmit. <laughs> we don't use those strategies. And I think consequently, we end up with this disconnect. And uh, so I would say philanthropy could play a major role, but it's a question of how the monies are invested. Uh, and we've seen, I think, a lot of uh, misinvestments uh, in the last few years, particularly by some of the big ones, like Broad and Walton. <laughs> yes. Thanks for a great talk. It was really uh, inspiring. And uh, a related question is about for-profit schools, which you didn't mention. But you know, it's related to the private sector. That was a great point about the private is where the money is. But how concerning is the f profitization wave and families like the Waltons, etc., profiting off of public education? It seems incredibly concerning. But I'm wondering. You want to say more? 
Oh, it is. And it's not just the, um, you know, th there are these for-profit charter schools that are out there now, and, and a lot of them are online schools um, that are making lots of my CEOs get paid a million dollars. Um, no accountability, no kind of public scrutiny over what's going on or transparency and how the money's being used. Um, so I think there's a great deal to be concerned about. I all, I'm also concerned about the role of the testing companies, like Pearson, right? and the profits they're reaping, and the way in which they then drive not just the test, but then the curriculum. It's a, a, increasingly a monopoly over education that a few companies have been able to develop. So all of that, I think, is reason for concern, <laughs> reason for more public engagement over what's going on in our schools. And that's the reason why, you know, what can, always concerns me in so many cities is, you know, we see the public schools as being for those kids, right? You know, I can't tell you how often I go to a city where, you know, they take so much pride in their sports team. I was in Baltimore. They love those Ravens. They love the Ravens more than they love their kids because they put their kids in shitty schools. Right? But they will do anything. They will buy a new stadium for the Ravens. Right? It says a lot about our values, right? So. The, the, it, you know, I think that's why when I keep going back to public will, we've got to figure out how do we generate a sense of pride, collective ownership, and collective concern about what's happening in our communities to kids, even if they're other people's children, not our own, which I think is what often gets in the way of that sense of concern. I mean, we talked about it earlier with a group of young people. Hope High is, what, not a quarter mile away? <laughs> right. And uh, from this great university, and always you know, blew my mind that somehow the benefits of the proximity don't accrue to Hope High, except for students who want to go do research projects. And tutors. And tutors. I'm going to get some tutors out of it, too. <laughs> yes. uh, Dr. Noguera, thank you for everything you've had to offer us. And uh, I taught in Miami for two years in the inner city in a hyper-segregated school, 99.9% .9 low income, 99.9%. African American and Hispanic. We had one European kid, but his mom made a mistake when they moved over because she didn't understand geography. <laughs> uh, and now I'm at an intentionally diverse charter school, and something I'm afraid of is how do we entice affluent or white parents to send their kids to school with black and brown children? And what prescriptions for desegregation, both in terms of class and race, do you have uh, in your mind? The only thing that can, uh, I, I had this, this is a debate I had with Gary Orfield, who's a friend. Um, and you know he was advocating. Um, you know he's still he's still beating the drum about desegregation. And he was you know uh, he and I were debating about whether or not you could use class uh, instead of race because the court said you couldn't use race to desegregate schools in Cambridge. And I said Gary it won't work because the, you you can only make poor kids go to certain schools. You can never make middle class people put their kids in schools unless they believe they want to. And what's going to make them want to? It's got to be the quality of the education that kids will receive. Quality will drive it, not compulsion. Right? And so that's got to be the issue. You've got to figure out ways. So the Met is doing it. What is the Met? Met has a high quality. Program. Kids are coming in from rural Rhode Island to go to the Met. Right? I, I'd say if you, right outside of Hartford, there's a whole magnet uh, system, <coughs> CREC, that is also doing quite well and deliberately diverse. Now, they had a court order that brought the funds in. But there are examples of schools, Brockton High School, that are diverse, but what's driving and sustaining it is the quality of what they provide, not some mandate. Because you can't make people who have options put their kids in schools unless they want to be there. Uh, I did, okay, I'll go here and then there. So as a graduate student here at Brown and a founding teacher of a charter school here in Providence, one thing I'm really interested in is how do you create the school culture that will lead to that capacity, lead to that cultural competency that can then best serve all your students of color? How do you start with that in a new school? Yeah, well, I'm glad you raised that because culture ultimately is the variable, the key variable that distinguishes a school like PS138 that I described in South Bronx from the others, or 28 in Bed Stuy, or any number of others. So it's not, it's not to say that they don't also have strategies and other things they're doing, but what really makes it work is those relationships, right? It's the um, attitudes, expectations, values that also influence the kids. What we know is that cultures can't be imposed on schools. Right. They develop organically. Right? They develop through a sense of shared ownership of the work that they're doing. 
right? So a sense of community that starts, I'd say, amongst the staff, but then also includes the children and their parents. It's also rooted in practices and rituals that reinforce core values. Um, and, and, you know, it, but I would say a lot of it is about a sense of community that creates and sustains a culture over time. Um, and so again, remember the example of 138, who was my tour guide, the fourth grader? She's the one explaining to me how it works. Because it's totally a part of who she is now, right? She's like, why would anybody steal something? What, what, are, you, what are you coming from? You know? um, so that to me is a sign of a culture. But getting there requires ultimately lots and lots of buy-in. Buy-in from the adults, the parents, the children. They have to all believe in what they're doing and feel like they're part of it. Right, because you can't make them do it. So you talked about a lot of challenges that we face, but you also gave some examples of positive steps forward. And I'm very curious to know if overall you're more optimistic or more pessimistic <laughs> about the direction. So I, I, I've described myself before as a pragmatic optimist. <laughs> I don't know if that's an oxymoron, but I, I, I think it, it characterizes it pretty well. I'm not a naive optimist. Right? I don't just think that things will get better because it, um, you know, it was that movie, you say movie, it's not going to get, uh, things will get better in the end. If it's not the end, that means they will get better, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I believe that I'm prag pragmatic enough to know that there are serious obstacles that we've got to confront that require struggle. I just did an article um, called Agency versus Grit, right? Because this concept of grit is getting a lot of attention. They talk about this is a personal attribute that some kids have. If you've got grit, well, this is going to be the key attribute that leads to success in life. And what they completely ignore in focusing on grit is the fact some kids have real obstacles that you, no matter how persistent you are, there's no heat at home, you're cold, right? Or you're hungry because there's no food, right? Um, and I give an example in there of an undocumented student who's got more grit than anybody at the school. He's acing it and still can't go to college because the law doesn't provide. Right? So he takes his grit to McDonald's where he's still working. But he doesn't settle because he also has agency. And he organizes with other undocumented youth to push for the DREAM Act, which the State Assembly did not approve yesterday in New York. But that to me, agency where you confront the barriers is what gives me a sense of optimism. Seeing young people and sometimes their allies being willing to do that, to me, gives me a sense of optimism about what's possible. But it's not rooted in some naive belief that it will all just go away eventually. Um, can you talk a little bit about Teach for America and um, the way that uh, Teach for America as an organization has shaped certain educational policies and um, also exacerbated certain inequalities um, that you've been speaking about? So I feel like Teach for America the way I do about charter schools. I don't, um, I, I think the individuals who do Teach for America usually do it for good reasons. They want to do something good. Right? And a lot of times in many schools I work uh, with, I see some of the most dedicated people I meet are Teach for America fellows or uh, graduates. So I don't hold the, blame the individuals. However, as a policy, I'm very concerned. Why would we think it's a good idea to take the least experienced people and put them in the most challenging schools? There's absolutely no research that this is to support this as a strategy. Right? We should be taking people with track record of proven effectiveness and putting them into struggling schools, not brand new 22 year olds. Right? That's just what we do. Um, I think what's more, what really concerns me is that when districts have a perverse incentive to, to lay off veteran teachers to replace them with cheaper Teach for America fellows. And that concerns me with how it's being used now. Right? I think the same thing about charter schools. I think charter schools should and can, in many cases, offer an opportunity to do something different and, and, and more innovative than is possible in the traditional public schools. But what concerns me again is how the proliferation of charter schools is being rolled out in many places because it's exacerbating the inequities. The neediest children are never in the lottery. Their parents don't know there's a lottery. Right? So, you know, I'll give you an example of a very high performing charter school in Harlem, located in the same building with the public school. The public school, over 50% of the kids are homeless, not a single homeless child in the charter school. Why? Homeless people aren't in the lottery. Neither are the undocumented, neither are lots of other very needy children. So I, I get worried when we start to, 
the absence of policy then is used and, and is contributing to greater inequities. And that way I think we have to address. Uh, yes, over here. Hi, um, I'm a, I think this is a question. Oh, cool, okay. Um, I'm a dual language teacher in Central Falls, and I'm just wondering if you could give us um, your opinion on the role of dual language and bilingual education in creating educational equity and kind of this culture change that you're talking about, and also um, how we can make sure that it does not lead to greater um, segregation and homogeneity in terms of student population. Well, I mean, when done well, the research on dual language programs, when done well, is very clear that they're, they're the best way to produce kids who are truly bilingual, right? Um, which is what we want, ideally, that they not lose the native language, but that they simply acquire a second language even as they sustain the literacy in the primary language. That's the ideal. That way, those kids are going to have more opportunities to develop to later on. Um, but for that to work, you need well-trained teachers right, who know how to teach well in both languages across content, so they can teach math and science and things like that as well. Um, you also need, it, ideally it would help if you had English speakers in there as well, so that the learning is not just um, from the teacher to the student, but amongst the students themselves. That, um, and that learning opportunity also enhances opportunities for children. So it's always, in education, it's always a question of how something is done. Lots of good ideas get done poorly, and then we blame the idea, but really it was just that you did it badly. Um, and, and so when done well, I think it's, it, I mean, the, the Canadians, again, those crazy Canadians, they think you can learn French and English, and, and they do sometimes. <laughs> With the new initiatives that have rolled out with the Obama administration, my brother's keeper, and also the guidance um, for discipline, how would you advise districts to implement those policies and programs on the school level so that it's not just a nice, lofty policy that's sitting in a code of conduct somewhere, but that teachers are actually implementing these programs that are now being charged from the top down? So I had a question, a, a conversation about that yesterday uh, with the, a district leader in New York who's, who's explained to me that uh, how so many schools are just suspending kids repeatedly and, and not even seeing how the exclusion of these kids is actually contributing to their and undermining their performance at school, the night school. And they've come back and they're further behind. Now, I heard a principal at a high school in Brooklyn. He said, you know, we suspend because we lack other tools. That really, he said, if I had a social worker who could help me in addressing some of the underlying issues that a student is presenting, I might not have to suspend. But I don't have a social worker, so I just send the kid home. Now, I, I think there's some truth there, but I do think we need to be much more creative in the way we em employ discipline in schools. I would say, why would you think that sending a child home to watch television is an effective form of discipline? I mean, it's crazy. I was at a school in Cleveland, saw a principal suspend a student for truancy. He said, I'm give you three days, kids say, give me five days. He said, okay, you get five days, smart Alec. He leaves the room, I said, do you think that's going to change anything? He says, it's not going to change his behavior, but it'll get him out of my hair for five days. And I think that's really what's happening, is that we're using suspension as a way to get rid of kids that we don't really want to serve. And that's what I think schools have to be held accountable for. Now, the other side of that is that schools still need help dealing with behavior. You can't learn in an unsafe, disorderly school. And so we need other, this goes back to school culture, this goes back to the relationships. You know, there's a middle school in Brooklyn that's had no suspension for four years in a row. None. I'm telling them, why don't you bring principals from other schools to go visit that school? And it's an all-male school. And it's not just because they just put up with a lot of bad behavior. So there are examples. We don't learn enough from examples of success. We really don't, not in education. We only have time for two more questions. So, um, so you, in your writing, have talked a lot about how unions need to be a part of this discussion. In the, an article you wrote for The Nation, you said that um, they would, in fact, want to remove ineffective teachers from the classroom. Could you expand upon that idea and how unions could influence policy? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote this with the president of the American Federation of Teachers because I felt like the unions can't just react um, to the reforms. They have to actually promote the kinds of change they think are needed. I think it's a mistake for unions to say we're going to defend bad teachers right, or irresponsible teachers. right? And, and I can name many cases where they have because they think that that's their job is to protect their members. I would say this, you could think about it as their job is to protect the profession, not the members. Right? And if they're protecting the profession, then getting rid of offenders actually helps their members because it keeps the status of teachers high. Because right? people know, oh, to be a teacher, you're not allowed to drink in school. You're not allowed to miss every Friday. You're not allowed to, you know, to show videos. Right? And, and, and that would actually help reinforce the stature of the profession rather than say, we're going to protect, protect everyone um, because that's our mission is to protect our members. I think that's a mistake that I see too many locals fall into. I think you get the last one. But for students in higher ed, what changes um, and supports do you think we need to see um, to support low-income and first-gen students? Well, there, there's so many changes. You know, I was talking about this with Dennis. Is Dennis here? Licky? From um, the Met, he said he might come. And he was saying, you know, we talk, always talk about getting kids college ready. We don't ever talk about making college kid ready, right? <laughs> Especially for kids who are first generation. Uh, and. Um, there's so much about being, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself as a brand new freshman at Brown. There was so much about this experience I had no clue about. I didn't know what a fraternity was. Never heard of one until I got here. I used to see people wearing the alligator on the shirts. I was like, is this a club, an alligator club? Why are they wearing this? Is this up with this alligator, right? You know? and it was a class difference that I didn't, I didn't, it was just beyond my experience. And it took me a while to kind of pick up on things, but imagine, you know, if you read A Hope in the Unseen, how many of you read that about Cedric Jennings, right? So much of his issues are really about the class difference, you know, of, and not fitting in to a place, or how hard it is to fit into a place like this when you come from low income community in D.C. So I think that, that the universities, uh, particularly a liberal university like this one, that are, you know, trying to be diverse, then they have to do so much to then help those, to, to create an environment where those young people can be successful, right? And I know they do a lot with peer counseling and all that, that's wonderful. Um, but I think that, you know, Martin Martell was uh, my mentor, right? Uh, and what was important about Martin as a professor of sociology, first of all, he taught courses that explicitly dealt with race, which I hear the sociology department doesn't do anymore. They, they gave up on race a while ago. It's not so important anymore, right? Um, race and inequality. Uh, but he would seek out students to mentor. Now, you had to put up with his chain smoking, right? Because he was like four pack a day cigarette smoker, right? So that was tough. But the fact that they had this professor willing to take an interest in me, it was so important to my development. I mean, I would not have entered a PhD program if it was not for him. I had never even thought about that as a possibility. Um, and so, you know, in addition to what the institution does, there are kind of individuals, faculty and staff who are doing things to help students to feel welcome, feel part of the institution. Claude Steele's written a lot about this, about his experience at the University of Michigan, and how the big change for him occurred when he started to feel like he was part of the lab instead of like the black guy in the psych department. Um, and those kinds of changes, I think, are, uh, really help to produce changes in not just the experience, but also in, in what's possible for the young people later. Thank you. Thank you. Good